Um, we're very lucky to have Antonio Lopez here, who's joining us from the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, so he is a senior ge geospatial data scientist there, and he's going to be talking a little bit about how location data can help model demand for energy and make predictions in his sector. So please help me in welcoming Anthony to the stage. Um, so, real quick, uh, can I get a show of hands of people who know what the, uh, of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory? Hey, all right, it's a great showing. All right, so uh, we're a national laboratory. We're the only uh, federal laboratory in the United States that focuses solely on uh, renewable energy uh, commercialization, uh, development, and research. So, um, with that, uh, today, what I really want to talk to you about is how we're using spatial analysis to advance renewable energy um, and visualization as well. So at NREL, um, we really have kind of a, a big focus here, and our focus is on reliable, resilient, and, and affordable clean energy. Uh, and to get there, we have to think big. We have to think about the big picture, right? And this is how can we realize high penetrations of renewable energy while simultaneously achieving these broad goals? And if so, um, you know, what technologies help us get there? Um, and what, help, what help us most? Um, what constraints and challenges are we facing? So this visualization right here is really kind of just putting the point across that, uh, well, first of all, this is the uh, western and eastern interconnect of the United States and Canada. And it's basically showing every generator um, across that space um, on an hourly basis producing energy to meet our load. And the point is, is that there's a lot of data. It's a very complex model. There's a lot going on here, right? And there's a lot that we have to think about. So because these, these, these questions are so complex, um, we, we really have to develop, we've been forced to develop state-of-the-art tools, state-of-the-art data, and state-of-the-art visualizations that really help us kind of dive into the complexities of these problems. And really rooted in all of this, um, and in some cases driving our results is, is our, in our understanding is spatial temporal modeling and data. Uh, and in this uh, GIF here, you can see uh, this is a, an immersive environment we have at, at NREL that allows us to get past you know, even the 3D stage and start getting the n-dimensional stage where we're, we're really exploring a, a wide parameter space. So, and, 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 and really, there's, um, there's this fundamental problem with renewable energy, well, fundamental challenge, I should say, not problem, um, that we're faced with. And it's that it's variable and continuous in both space and time. And really, this poses a lot of challenges to our traditional models, right? Because it comes down to how can you take something, a phenomena that's inherently continuous and variable, um, and, and cram it into discrete model space, whether it's nodal or regional, right? And so, um, uh, really, it's, it's how can, and, and, and the biggest question is, is how can we ensure that we're preserving and properly characterizing this resource whose inherent challenge is variability? And that's an example of wind. And it's not just wind that has this issue or this challenge. Um, it's, it's most of our renewable resources. Um, you know, they all have this geographic diversity. And, and in fact, you know, this, it, again, I, I said problem, but it's not really a problem, it's just a challenge. And in fact, it's actually a good challenge because it can also present um, reliability to our electric grid if we accurately represent it. So, now that we've kind of laid out the problems, or laid out the challenges, you know, what is the solution? You know, what can we apply to these challenges? Well, of course, the answer is spatial analysis, right? That's why we're all here. So, now, spatial, when I say spatial analysis, I'm not really referring to you know, GIS. I guess I kind of am. But at NREL, we're really moving beyond GIS. And I heard a couple other talkers um, say this today, and it, it really got me excited. Um, because we at NREL, we're really embracing what we call geospatial data science. Um, and really what this is, is, is kind of a combination of traditional geosp GIS, geospatial big data, uh, spatial statistical, geostatistical analysis, and spatial temporal and multivariate uh, modeling and visualization. That's what's kind of what we, we think of as encompassing all of this. 
So at NREL in our, in our, in our spatial uh, team, in our spatial data science team, we have kind of a broad research focus, but it can be presented in this kind of pyramid, right? And this pyramid represents levels of potential, right? Whereas you move up the, the levels, the, the pyramid, you're applying you know, technological constraints or economical constraints um, uh, to, to kind of whittle down the resource until you kind of ultimately find what the developable renewable energy potential is. And within each of those, you have kind of research domains that we're trying to look at, population dynamics, you know, costs, wildlife issues, and barriers, right? And really, this is kind of just a sample of what we're looking at. But more for, to specifics, um, I jump into to right now. So, so one of the big uh, research focus areas where we're kind of advancing renewables is, uh, is trying to understand barriers and regulations, uh, meaning that you know, what are the sociological, ecological, um, and technological barriers preventing renewable energy from being deployed? Or, and basically what this comes down to very simply as, is we can't develop every windswept uh, ridge. And we, not, we might not want to. You know, there might be wildlife interactions that we want to prevent. There might be, you know, endangered species, or there might be, uh, you know, a historical uh, preservation uh, that we want to keep in mind. And the, the key here is, is that this fundamentally changes the available supply of renewable energy in a given region. As you can imagine, that's pretty impactful. Another way we're using spatial analysis um, is through transmission analysis. And so basically, a lot of renewables are site dependent. You have to build on site, right? And given that's site dependent, you have to evacuate that energy somehow, right? And you have to do that through developing spur lines, right? And so, Basically, what we're trying to do with spatial analysis is understand the relationship between the quantity and quality of the, of the renewable resource and its proximity to existing infrastructure. How far do you have to go? What is that cost going to look like? Could you actually do that given kind of the land development restrictions and more? Another example is through these uh, wind farm characterization and classification, it's archetype classification. Basically, we're taking the existing wind turbine database um, throughout the entire United States. We're applying some characterizations to this to try to better understand existing development patterns so that way we can project development patterns out into the future, what they might look like. Probably one of the most impactful um, pieces of, uh, that, that we contribute to at, at NREL uh, in the geospatial data and science team is, is resource analysis. So when I say resource, it's how much does the wind blow, how much does the sun shine, um, and I say it like that, but it's actually really, really hard. And there's so many different models, right? There's, there's numerical weather prediction models, there's semi-empirical models, there's physics-based models. Um, all have their kind of differences, their accuracies, their deficiencies. You know, what are those? Um, when we compare them, when we use them in our downstream analysis and downstream models, how do they change our answers? If they, do they change it at all, right? In addition, they have, different, they have different accuracies. So can we compare these to ground measurements? They have different uncertainties, and they, have a, and they also have a variability. How do we understand the variability within the wind resource? Meaning that the sun doesn't always shine the same, the wind doesn't always blow the same, year, at, year in and year out. You, you have El Nino effects. Um, you have volcanoes erupt. You know, how can these influence and impact our ability to generate energy when we depend on you know, the natural resources? Uh, probably one of the f funnest things we do at NREL here is, is, is generator modeling, which is kind of a, a systems engineering combined with spatial analysis, right? So what you're, what you're seeing up here really is, 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 uh, is a generator performance of different photovoltaic technologies. And what we're trying to understand is across broad geographies, you know, how do they perform? And now that we know how they perform, what are the relative economics, right? And what this allows us to do is evaluate research and development pathways. So in all of this, uh, all these are kind of like disparate pieces of analysis and research that we're doing, and we're starting to think about it a lot differently now. And the way we're thinking about it is more kind of a, uh, an ecosystem, a framework of analysis, because they all kind of feed into one another, right? And so we're doing this now with our spatial temporal techno-economic, say that 10 times fast, uh, model called the Renewable Energy Potential Model, or REV. And what REV is, is it really combines together 
all of what I was just kind of just talking about earlier. We have our resource information, we have our systems engineering modeling, we have our, our economics, we have our technical spatial um, constraints and our transmission, uh, our transmission analysis. And we're feeding this all together in this one ecosystem to come up with these geospatial supply curves to illuminate the results of technological advances or constraints and barriers, whether they're wildlife, whether they're social, political, or more. And probably what's really fascinating is, and, and what I, I, get, I get excited about as well, is that you know, spatial analysis and the research we do, it really feeds in, it, it, it in and itself is, is, is illuminating, right? You, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can write a lot of research about what we do in and itself. But it also feeds into so, so much more. You know, it's the spatial analysis and spatial, the, the results of the spatial analysis are fundamental, foundational to just about all downstream analysis that when it, when it comes to the electric grid. Whether it's unit commitment, whether it's resource planning, root, di distributed generation adoption, or policy making, it all depends on spatial analysis, which is pretty, it's, it's pretty exciting, you know? There we go. So, uh, you know, even if, so as we become more successful at, you know, reducing the technological and economic barriers to renewable energy, you know, we're going to be faced, we're, we're going to be faced with kind of the changes to our built and our natural environment, right? So what are those? How can we, how can we, you know, can we envision those? You know, can we anticipate those challenges? And if so, can we come up with different solutions? So here I'm, I'm showing basically, this is a modeling result. We're projecting the growth of renewable energy out into 2050, um, the year 2050 under a different kind of uh, policy regime. And you can see here that, you know, you have the purple areas where we're, we're projecting, projecting wind farms to be developed. Um, and then we're actually overlaying the existing turbines in the, on the yellow there um, that show kind of a good alignment, which kind of, proves two things. One, we're doing a really good job of modeling, and two, our industry is doing a really good job of uh, developing cost-optimal locations. Uh, in any case, I ended a little early. Um, I want to thank Cardo, did a fantastic job. It helps really get our research results out there. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, research is not the, the, the prettiest thing. It, it gets put into a paper, gets lost in a journal. Um, Cardo's doing a fantastic job of helping us kind of spread the word and getting our research um, out to the broader community. So, thank you very much.